maybe not your entire customer base, but a certain segmented profitable area that you would want to focus on for your podcast. And that would be something that you can bring in your new audience. And again- Hey everyone, this is Nazar Akil from Max Pro. Hi, I'm Linda. And I'm Paul. And we're Love and Pebbles. Hi, this is Lopa Vandermersch from Rasa. Oh, and you're listening. And you're listening. And you are listening to, to the e Show. Show. Welcome to the e Show, presented by Blue Tusker. The number one place to hear the inside scoop from other e-commerce experts, where they share their secrets on how they scaled their business and are now living the dream. Now, here is your host, Andrew Math. And my name is Andrew Mathitone. I will be your host. And today we are talking about why marketing shouldn't end after the sale. This one is a very interesting topic for me because I've, I've found this in almost every brand I've ever worked in where... They do all this hard work to get the sale, to get the lead, uh, to get the customer, whichever way, and then it just stops and it ends there. And that is simply just not how it should be done. And one of the reasons I say this is because, A, the most obvious one is buyer's remorse is a real thing. You don't want someone to feel like they had their hand held all the way up to the the point of purchase or the basically the conversion any lead or however you want to look at that and then feel like all right okay bye i got what i wanted um you're basically like one night standing (laughs) this uh person which is kind of messed up so one of the things i've always referenced is there's a ton of things you can market to them after so you have the obvious stuff right like all right you can upsell you can cross sell you can do all this extra stuff or after but sometimes when you do um Specifically, I found this obviously for ourselves when I was doing agency stuff or when I'm doing more like B2B or service related where, yeah, I can upsell them, but it's not yet. It's not ready for that. And one of the things I always like to do is to find other ways of things that I can provide some extra value to them after a sale so that they feel like, oh, I they I, they just gave me, you know, what they uh, what I bought from them. So they got what they wanted but they're still giving me some extra here and it really makes them feel more comfortable about what they just did. So a couple examples I had for you, uh, works really well with B2B, um, specifically where you can do, uh, post, uh, so you can do post conversion, uh, post customer, uh, acquisition, um, ads in some cases. So it can work pretty well for some B2B. It does work well for e-commerce also, but kind of depends on which e-commerce, but there's a lot of other areas this could work. But essentially create uh, either some kind of some some kind of community. So a Facebook group, if you're doing social ads, or you could also do like a Slack community or something like that, where you try to bring everyone into one place. So for example, uh, when I was targeting e-commerce sellers, we did this where we created a Facebook group that was specifically for e-commerce sellers, and then we would break off that group for, you know, uh, eight-figure sellers and things like that. Then I've done uh, Slack communities for staffing agencies where we did, hey, join this uh, Slack community, and if you're for it's strictly for staffing agencies and things like that. And those were all ads that we ran after the conversion. When you're doing B2B and you have that kind of personal conversation with someone, you don't necessarily need to do that. You could, those could, those could also be um, ads that you run after someone has converted with just any other gated content. Um, But if you do e-commerce and maybe you're selling more B2B related e-commerce equipment, so like bigger machines or something like that, it's another great way to have some kind of community. And honestly, I think the best thing about those groups are that you can you can control the conversation if you want, um, or you can just sit back and, and listen to what all your customers are talking about. I mean, it's a great way to come up with like ideas for like blog posts and stuff that you want to write is you just go into the group and be like, what's everyone talking about? Like, all right, let me write one of those. Um, the other thing was case studies. So this is a great for an upsell. Um, it's also great for, uh, you to be able to explain to a client um, that the decision they made was great. So a lot of SaaS companies do this kind of thing where they'll send out an email with, hey, we have this great story about this company that used our software to go from X to Y. Um, from Or Y to X. X to Z. A to Z. Let's do that. Um, alphabet. And uh, 
So you can do things like that where you can show them the, you can show them a case study and you basically be like, hey, look, look, this worked really well. And then this is their opportunity to go, hey, may, uh, why is this not working for me is probably what they're going to say. But that's your opportunity to go, you know what, let's look into your account. Let's see what you have set up. And then that's your opportunity to either A, upsell them on other stuff, or B, to help adjust what they're doing in their account, which hopefully will help them be better at business, which then becomes a referral situation, which brings me into the next one, referrals. So doing a referral program, some, running some kind of, of, of campaign after an acquisition and explain to them that they can join a referral program. And yes, maybe there's some kickback uh, depending on how you put that campaign together. But there's a lot of things that, that can still happen that are not necessarily upsell opportunities. Upsell opportunities seem pretty obvious, so I don't want to touch on those. But assuming that they bought everything from you that they could possibly buy. So maybe you offer certain services and they bought every freaking service. So great. What else can you do? There's always more you can do. And that idea of, of bringing them on to a group and controlling that conversation or having them become a referral or anything along those lines, or even just sharing case studies with them just so that they know like, hey, the decision you made to work with us was a good one. We did it for so-and-so. We can do it for you. Um, these are all great ways to market people after a sale or after they become a customer. We are talking about the most important KPIs that you should and shouldn't be paying attention to. And I love this episode. The reason I'm gonna love this episode so much is because it's gonna stir up some shit. And I love, I love causing, I love seeing marketers fight in the comments. <laughs> so I did, uh, I made a list of five that you should be following that to me seem obvious and then five that you shouldn't be. And I'm going to give you some insight on, on why I think all this is. And one of the th one of my, my, uh, my things I've always said, I think I've said it several times in this podcast in the short time I've been doing it, that the most important KPI next to conversion is email. How big, and obviously you're going to want to, uh, there, again, there's going to be things in here that are dependent and there's going to be things on like, oh yeah, well, I don't care how big your email list is if no one responds to an email. But I'm going to say, your ability to create emails. So the size of your list, uh, it's very, um, it's very relevant to, uh, a phallic response <laughs> in which case it's not the size of your list, but it's how you use it. Um, and if you don't use it, you lose it. And, uh, wow, there was another one. There's another one that my buddy told me it was hilarious. Like that is disgusting. Um, but essentially, that you need you need to know how to use it too um but moving on email list size your email list is very very important um it is dependent on how you use it and how engaged everyone is yes but your ability to grow emails is the second most important thing outside of an actual conversion um the second one i was going to do conversion rate that one's pretty obvious uh again i think all these ones that, that are general are, are obvious but to me these are like the ones where i go okay if i had a dashboard on a tv up in the office somewhere and i want to know what's going on these are like the top five where i go where are we at with this and the reason i say conversion rate is because it can tell you a lot if your conversion rate is consistently you know at a certain number and then the next day it tanks one of two things can happen. Your website may have gone down. You could have gotten a butt ton of traffic from something that you don't even know. There's so many things that can cause a conversion rate to fluctuate that if you see a conversion rate fluctuation, you immediately know something has changed. What has changed? And obviously, the better the conversion rate, the better you're doing, but you want to know what has changed, even if it went up. So if you walk in one day and you look at your board and you go, wow, my conversion rate is double what it was yesterday. That to me even though it's a good thing, could be a red flag because it could also mean that some of the traffic you were driving before that normally wasn't converting as well, maybe that traffic's just not being driven right now. So now you need to go look at your lead flow account or what your sales are at for that day or something like that. So it, it can still show you a lot about what's going on. Um, lifetime value. This one is very important and I'm shocked at how many people don't have an answer for this when I talk to them. Um, I, it's the next one, actually, I'll, I'll jump ahead a minute here is, is your, uh, your CPA. So your cost per acquisition. And if you are spending X to bring in a customer and that customer's, you know, first, uh, order with you or their first thing that they buy from you is Y, then all of a sudden you can go, great. I made X on this, on this sale. But a lot of times what so many companies don't think about is the lifetime value 
because if that customer, if it cost you $5 to get a customer to spend $10, that's awesome. So you got uh, $2 for every dollar that you spent. But if that customer on average shops with you or you know stays with you for several contracts or whatever the business is that you have for a longer time, then who gives a shit if it costs you $5? If it costs you $10, it may cost you $20 to convert for a $10 order. But if that person consistently orders with you for so long, then that's much more important. So your average order value is interesting, but I really want to know what the lifetime value of the customer is because that's going to tell me on average, I'm going to make X on this person if I spend X. It's basically Amazon's whole thing is why they spend so much money acquiring customers and putting out so much content and are okay with charging significantly less because they know they're going to keep that customer and that they're going to spend X or Y over there. I got to stop doing alphabet shit with this, but they're going to keep spending so much over a certain period of time. Uh, And then the next one, CTR, so your click-through rate. And the reason I picked this one is kind of, it's basically your conversion rate for your paid advertising, right? And the reason I chose this is it, it does tell you a lot about your impressions versus your clicks. It tells you if the content and or your copy is good enough. And it will also kind of give you some insight into a lot of other things. So as I mentioned, conversion rate can tell you like what's working, what's not. And if your click-through rate is fluctuating, it can tell you that something really good is happening or something really bad is happening. Even if the click-through rate has improved, it doesn't always mean that the the solution, or I'm sorry, the cause was, was actually positive. Um, so I always keep an eye on click-through rate. And so now I'm gonna go into the five things that I personally never really give a shit about. And one of the first ones is my favorite, so reach or impressions. So here's the deal. I uh, have only I, we we don't work with very very large companies often. I'm not I'm not the marketing agency for Coke. I wish I was. Uh, Pepsi won't take me either. But your reach and impressions mean nothing to me if there's nothing else tied to it. It is the most BS vanity vanity metric that I've had so many marketers say like Yeah, but we reached 2.4 billion people in the past month. Go, but great, I don't care. Did how many of those actually bought? Like it means nothing to me. I know brand awareness is very, very important. And brand awareness is definitely something that needs to be focused on. And I'm always interested in what how many people we did reach, but I'm never adjusting my copy or my creative or anything like that to try to reach more people just to hone in on that one metric. Basically, I use that metric as a great, we reached a lot of people and we brought some brand awareness but I'm currently more and more focused on how's my conversion doing? How's all that other stuff? Uh, the next one, social media followers don't care. Great. You have 5,000 million followers, which isn't even a number, but it's a thing. And you have, uh, 400 million people following you on Instagram. And when I make a post four people like it, bite me, I don't care how many followers you have. It means nothing. Your engagement rate's a different story because that will tell me your followers versus how many people actually care, but I don't care about how many social media followers you have. And that stands for businesses and brands too, not just obnoxious influencers. Um, This one's interesting. Gross revenue. Don't really care. uh, Only because uh, it's a vanity metric. Like, great, we did uh, $1.2 million this month. It was our biggest month ever. Awesome. How much did we spend? Uh, 1.4. Well, look, that's crap. Like who, <laughs> I don't care. And then, oh, it's uh, e-commerce. Oh, we did $500,000 this month. Awesome. But how many of those did we give a 60% discount coupon to be like all of them? Great. That means nothing to me. And we lost money. So the, the gross revenue is interesting. It's a definitely a vanity metric. I like using it uh, to more kind of help with company culture, just because to me, it's a little bit easier to kind of understand like, Hey, we hit this new milestone of this much money. And as long as our profitability kind of remains, then great. So gross revenue is interesting, but I always like to know not necessarily bottom line, but somewhere in, in bottom line and you can't live off bottom line, which by the way, will probably be another podcast. I'll do Uh, CPM your cost per viewing thousand people. I don't care. Uh, great. Awesome. Obviously, CPMs are all up and down right now because of, or at least on Facebook ads, because of everyone kind of leaving Facebook for a little while there. Um, but it, it doesn't mean much to me. It is something I look at. Uh, all of these, I definitely look at them. I don't ignore them. But they're not something that I make rash decisions on. CPM is kind of telling me more where, where the that platform that I'm using is, or where the industry is, and less about my ads. 
unless I look at one specific ad and it's got a great relevancy score and it's showing significantly more. It's a different story, but I usually don't care that much about CPM. And last but not least, uh, website traffic from social media. So <laughs> this one's interesting. And the reason this one's odd is because it kind of counter, it's counteractive to my first one I did, which was impression and reach. So the traffic you're getting from social media is not what social media is for. Unless you're running a lot of ads, and obviously you do want to drive some traffic to social media, but it's much more of a brand awareness play. So if you're doing, if you're able to reach several million people on Facebook, but none of them are clicking over, I would still tell you, yes, you need to continue to do that and build brand awareness. Maybe I won't put as much like capital behind it, or maybe I won't put as much work behind it, but... I don't care how much people are driving to my website because a lot of people, they'll see you on Facebook, but then they'll go Google you later and then they're coming from Google and you go, great, I should spend more money on Google, but it doesn't work that way. So a lot of these people are going to disagree with. So feel free to email me. Tell me whether you agree, disagree, or if you have any questions that you want me to go over this week, next week, or any other week. Super stoked for this one. I actually really like this one. I wrote this one up myself as a blog post and then realized I had to do this as a podcast. So I'm going to fly through this one kind of like I did yesterday. But so these are my eight B2B strategies that obviously we use ourselves that actually work really well for B2C. And every time I tell an e-commerce seller like, hey, you should try this, they always go, fuck you, that's not going to work. And they're wrong. So here's what we're going to go through. Eight of them. So live webinars, gated content, making your influencer kind of a founder thing, LinkedIn, partnerships with other companies, informative new letter, newsletters, in-person events, and podcasts. So like this podcast. So I'm going to hammer through examples for all those. So live webinars. So if you are a e-commerce seller, let's say that you, uh, I'm going to use a uh, guy I worked with before for years, sells collegiate apparel. What we did is we set up a live webinar where we actually got some of the coaches from Alabama to do a Q&A. He had a very big audience of Alabama fans, and we just segmented them into one email list, reached out to them, and said, hey, we're doing a live Q&A webinar with so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so from Alabama before the season. Sit down and ask them any questions that you want. It worked amazingly. Obviously, at the end, we were able to do a giveaway. We had all their emails. We were able to reach out to them, um, kind of put them through a different funnel, but worked awesome. That's one example of that. Uh, I'm just going to do one example of all these because it, it gets out of hand. Uh, so gated content, tripwires, things like that, ebooks, white papers, calculators, quizzes, all that stuff works great. Every e-commerce seller thinks that, okay, fine, I get it, I'll do a blog, but my pop-up is still going to be 10% off when you sign up for our newsletter. Well, bite me, I'm so tired of doing that because most of the time what's going to happen is someone's going to sign up and then they're never going to, they're going to unsubscribe probably. So gated content ebook super easy especially if you do like food so a massive ebook of you know um, recipes or something like that everyone a lot of sellers don't want to spend the money on it but honestly you could spend a thousand to two thousand dollars on an ebook and get a ridiculously nice ebook for that size that's a ton of content that is beautifully designed and you will get a ton of downloads out of it and then you're getting emails for less than giving away your percentage. So if you do the math on, okay, I gave away 10% over X amount of time, that's gonna be much, much more than the $1,500 you spent on an ebook after several months. Um, so consider it an investment. So making your founder and an influencer or something like that. So this is something a lot of B2B companies do. I'm literally doing it right now. Um, so basically taking your founder and making them kind of the face of the company. This works really well for products that people want to buy from a person and maybe not so much from a uh, just a, a company like a no-name face so if you think of a lot of athletes when they sell protein or when they sell gym clothing or things like that any kind of athletic apparel having a a uh, influencer as your founder really can kind of help because a lot of people will actually start to follow them and listen to them more than they will the company uh, LinkedIn Works really well, especially for B2C. Um, you have the option of retargeting. I still think that it's pretty much maintains a B2B environment. So if you have a product line that fits that, and that could be apparel, so even people who are talking about clothes that you wear in an interview, or maybe uh, 
business casual party stuff that you're wearing or anything like that, but anything that needs to be relevant to the audience. As long as you know the audience you're sticking to, LinkedIn can work very well. Of course, on a B2B e-commerce side, you can go that route too, but for the sake of this podcast, I'm not going to go there. Um, Partnerships. These work really well. Company partnerships. So blog exchanging, doing guest blog posts. Google says that they don't help. I think that they're lying. And yes, I realize that I said I think Google is lying, but I do. And so guest blog posts, things like that work great. But what I've also seen really well is partnerships where people will work with other companies that aren't competitors but have the same audience. And they'll actually do discounts in each other's newsletter. So this, uh, you know, this Friday we're sending out a discount for so-and-so's company, not ours. So now they're, the consumer is more inclined to stay with your newsletter because they don't know what they're going to get. They may get a discount for something else that they're really interested in. Um, it, so it'll actually keep your subscribe rates pretty high, but it'll also give you the opportunity to get in front of a new audience if you're the one partnering. Or you can do things where buy one of these and get one of these from so-and-so company free. Depends on the relationship you put together, but they can work phenomenally informative newsletters not every newsletter has to be a promotion you can if you're putting enough content together you can absolutely do a monthly newsletter of something that is not offering a discount if you are in instruments i've seen this done very well as a drummer myself i see it all the time where i'll get a monthly newsletter of just new cool youtube videos that are out or um, maybe new products in the industry that are coming out for certain companies and e-commerce that may not work but other uh concerts that are going on or things in your area or something like that that is not always promotional but you're always reaching out to your consumers so that they know that they're on your email list because the last thing you want is to go four or five months without doing your promotion then you send an email and now all of a sudden they have no idea who you are and they unsubscribe two more we're almost there in-person events so this would be doing like a conference or a meetup and again this is very similar to um the collegiate apparel guy i worked with so Basically, you don't need to always focus on your entire customer base. If you can segment your audience enough that you can still get them to show up somewhere. So even if we used him again as an example, we did actually set up a booth at an Alabama game. We set up a booth at a Notre Dame game. There's a ton of different ways that you can do that where you're kind of doing meetups. I've also seen companies that will do um, a trip that will hit five or six cities and actually do giant like happy hours or something like that. It's a little bit kind of like um, they are showing off product, but it's really more of a just bringing like-minded individuals into one place for a good time. And obviously the company is going to benefit from that. Last but not least, podcasts. So of course I'm doing one now, but I would still suggest them for B2C. And the reason is, is that there's so much you can talk about about your product and your product line. The collegiate apparel guy, obviously, same thing again, but You also have the benefit of a ton of other product lines. You have hobbyists who are always interested in talking about tons of different things. You have anything in sports where you could do a sports talk show. You have murder mystery people, so I don't know what you're selling, but it could totally work there too. You have to think about the maybe not your entire customer base, but a certain segmented profitable area that you would want to focus on for your podcast. And that would be something that you can bring in your new audience. about how you can scale your e-commerce company by purchasing other companies and by potentially paying zero dollars for them. Yes, it does sound like a scam. No, it's not. I'm actually gonna give some credit to uh, Roland Frazier for this. Brilliant guy, Uh, met him um, through a friend at, uh, was the conference, Traffic traffic and Conversions um, a couple years ago, obviously would have met him again probably this year, but you know, COVID. Um, but he, he does, he's just a brilliant guy listening to him speak was nuts. And one of the things that he's always kind of preached was the other ways to kind of scale things like the tricky ways to me, he's a growth hacker. I don't know if he actually likes to be called that, but he's a bit of a growth hacker. So acquiring other e-commerce companies, why would you do it? So expanding your product line seems pretty obvious. Um, that obviously you're going to take on. Um, some more assets, but you're also going to take on some more liabilities. And so that can get a little bit messy, but it is a great way and an easy way to expand your product line. If you have, um, let's say you do pet products and you sell, uh, I don't know, leashes and um, harnesses, 
and you go out and purchase someone who creates collars, like custom-made collars. It's a great extension of your product line. It can really help. Fantastic, awesome, do it. Seems pretty common, right? The other side of it that a lot of people don't think about is what else you can get out of that. Yes, you can learn some of their infrastructure. Maybe their manufacturer is great. Maybe their 3PL is great. There's some other things there, but the one thing that I find a lot of people don't think about is you can actually expand your list. So again, we'll use leashes and, and uh, harnesses as, a, as an example, and then you go out and you purchase collars. Well, what if they weren't really selling as much as they wanted to, uh, but they had a list of 500,000 people that buy seasonal dog collars? All of a sudden, you have 500,000 extra people that you can reach out to about a leash or about a harness. And so now you've expanded that. So now it's not so much about, can I continue to sell, sell these collars? Now it's more about, how can I leverage the existing audience of the, the collars purchasers and use them for me or for my own brand? So that is definitely a fantastic way. Now, the tricky way that Roland has always talked about, about how you do it at basically zero cost or a minimal cost is to actually work out a deal with some of these smaller companies who, who aren't doing as well and they're looking for a way to exit but they may be in a certain situation. So there's going to take some searching. There's going to take some extra things that you need to do to kind of really do your due diligence and make sure that you're finding the right person and the right company for this fit. But you can actually work your, work out a deal with them and structure something in a place where you actually are offering them a profit share of either everything that you sell or you're offering them a profit share of their product line. So if you were to buy the collars, you could say, I'll give you a dollar for every collar that I sell until you make $500,000, in which case, fantastic. You literally just bought an entire company and did nothing. You paid nothing and you're gonna, and you're gonna end up paying this guy for the next several years, but you're only giving him a dollar per unit and depending on your, your um, uh, uh, margin, of course, that may be totally worth it. Um, then I lost my train of thought. Then on the other side of it, obviously, you might be willing to completely allow, I'll give you 100% of the profit from the collars that I sell. So you're not going to make a dollar off the pro off the collars. However, you're going to be able to upsell them with your leashes, with your harnesses, with other things. So your current business is going to expand and then eventually you're going to pay off the previous owner and now you have both. So there's really ways that you can get creative with some of these structured deals. Some people are so afraid at purchasing another company and they're so worried about, oh, how's it gonna go? And there's so much, it gets so messy and it can and it does, but once you've done several of them, it, it starts to ease up. And you can actually just start to structure and template out how it is you purchase someone and what you have to do. And there's gonna be some lessons that you're gonna learn along the way. Maybe you reach out to Roland Frazier, I'm sure he'll help you with that. Um, but it's a fantastic way to grow your list. It's a great way to expand your product line, maybe even take on um, some existing capital if it's coming in, depending on how that looks. But you can get really creative with this kind of stuff. So check out places like Shopify Exchange. If you're a Shopify uh, seller, that's a great way to go. So Shopify Exchange is people who are looking to sell their Shopify sites and their businesses. Be careful with it because some people just create a shitty website and then try to sell the site itself. Um, biz buy sell is another great one and exchange marketplace is another great one. So check out those places. It doesn't even hurt to even look into it. Sometimes you can just set up alerts in a lot of these places and you can actually just find out like, Oh great. Here's a company in, you know, pet supplies that's interested and now I can go purchase them. Um, it's a great way to grow your company. Great way to expand it. Think about it, look into it. I don't want to ramble on about the same thing. And of course go check out Roland Flasier. But if not, I will talk to you all tomorrow. Rate, review, subscribe, and I will see them. Thank you for tuning in to the Ecom Show. Head over to ecomshow.com to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on the Blue Tusker YouTube channel. The Ecom Show is brought to you by Blue Tusker, a full service digital marketing company specifically for e commerce sellers looking to accelerate their growth. Go to bluetusker.com now for more information. Make sure to tune in next week for another amazing episode of the Ecom Show.